today, uh, we are going to have two passages. Our main passage is going to be John chapter 11, verse 1 through 46. However, to set that passage up, we're going to be in uh, Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. So Luke 10, 38 through 42, followed by John 11, uh, verses 1 through 46. So today, being the day that we celebrate uh, resurrection, uh, by way of introduction, I would remind us that outside of God Himself, the greatest power in the universe presently is sin and death. Every single person who has ever lived, with the exception of Enoch and Elijah, every single person that's ever lived, they have tasted death. Death has defeated them. They have tasted the grave. And if the Lord uh, delays in His return, death also will touch every single person in this room. Psalm 139.16 tells us that all of our days are written in God's book. Every single one of them. So what that means is we all have a birthday and we all have a death day and it is written and down in the book of God. And as it pertains to our death day, there is nothing that we can do to stop that day. And there's nothing we can do to slow it down. It's been determined by God. He has numbered our days. And in connection with death, some of the worst pain that we experience as human beings is in connection to death. The death of loved ones sometimes so destroy somebody that they are permanently for decades never the same. Some of our deepest fears surround death, whether it's our own deaths or deaths of loved one. And sometimes uh, people are in complete bondage to their fear of death. That's exactly what we read about in Hebrews 2. We even recently, just this last week, we saw the great efforts that the city went to uh, because that, that was motivated by the fear of death. What am I talking about? That Columbine copycat. There was hundreds of schools shut down over the Columbine, uh, the, the person who's obsessed with Columbine. Why? Because of death. Because of the reality of death. Because of the fear that she was going to kill and I'm, I'm not taking a shot at the school district. So I'm glad that they did it. I would have kept my kids home even if they didn't uh, do that. But the reason I bring that up is just to show there is a real power death has over us. Every single one of us, even believers who do not fear death because of the gospel, there's still this like, whoa, death. We have a respect for it. We, we, we avoid it as we should. We should try, you know, obviously we're going to try to um, do protective things uh, to keep people from dying. But at the end of the day, we can't stop it. And at the end of the day, death touches the entire created order. Animals, plants, birds, fish, people, everything is touched by death. And when the reality of death strikes you, and it will either taking your own life or someone close to you. When it strikes you, empty, vain, hallmark slogans are not going to help you. Positive thinking rooted in the goodness of man uh, is not going to help you. Powerless and well-intended, but powerless, empty, pithy statements like, we think they're in a better place. That stuff doesn't help you. What we need when we're facing death, when we're facing our own fears, or we're facing the reality of the death of, the, of a loved one, we need to root and anchor ourselves in a power and a reality that is greater than death. And we're not going to find that power. We're not going to find that glorious reality in the so-called goodness of man. We're not going to find the power of life out of death through strength in human numbers. We're not going to find the power to overcome death in human communities. We're not going to find the power to overcome death in the wisdom of men or the achievements of men or the resources of men. When your death day comes, there is no one you will be able to give enough money to to stop that day. 
So in order to have hope beyond the grave and not be enslaved by a paralyzing fear of death, the fear of death spoken about in Hebrews 2, in order to do that, we must look outside of ourselves and behold the God who in Christ is much more powerful than death. And so tonight we're going to look at a story that uh, pretty much preaches itself. It's my kind of story. Um, and as we look at this story, we're going to see a story that demonstrates the Christ-centered glory of God and how the one who calls himself the resurrection and the life, how he is more powerful than death. So our main text, John 11, verse 1 through 46. But to set that text up, we're going to begin with Luke 10, 38 through 42. So let's go ahead and turn there. Luke chapter 10, verse 38 through 42. Uh, let's begin with the first uh, two verses. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. Here is Mary sitting at the Lord's feet, listening to his teaching. And as this story unfolds, what we learn about Mary is that absolutely nothing is the priority over her uh, when it comes to worshiping God. He is number one. She is sitting at his feet, listening to his teaching, worshiping Christ in his presence. She knows she has to start with hearing. She has to start with sitting in the presence of glory, sitting in the presence of God and the one who is life. She needs that to start off the day. Everything else can take a back seat to sitting down in the presence of Christ. And as we read through our text in Luke and through our text in John 11, what I, one of the things I hope we take away from this is that sitting at the feet of Christ daily to worship Him, it prepares you for tragedy. The godly life that Mary lives and the readiness to face the dark days that are coming her way that we will read in about in John 11. She responds to those dark days with a great faith. Well, how? Because she has honed that faith and built that faith and lived into a regular rhythm and habit of worshiping at the feet of Christ and not letting things eclipse that from her life. The strong faith we will see from her, it is forged and strengthened through the daily worship of Jesus Christ. There's no substitute for it. And just like uh, an athlete has to train uh, for boxing matches or for basketball or whatever you're doing, you don't just step on the court and think that you're ready. You don't just step in the ring and see that you're ready. There is day in, day out grind to get yourself ready. Similarly, there is a day in, day out grind of worship to the Lord. Day by day, little by little, moment by moment, each day, opening your Bible, sitting at the feet of Jesus, worshiping Him, laying hold of Him till He moves your heart to rejoice in Him. When you do that for 20 years, oh man! What a beast in the Lord you become. So this is Mary. I love this about Mary. Um, let's go ahead and continue to read on verse 40 and 40 through 42. But Martha was distracted with much serving. <clears throat> and she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sisters left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered, Martha, Martha. You're anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. So here is this, uh, her, the sister Martha. Now Martha's not an unbeliever. I mean, she's calling him Lord. She, she, she loves him. She's serving him. It's just Martha's just distracted. And what is she distracted with? She's not distracted with pornography or drunkenness. She's not distracted with sin. She's distracted with something good. She's distracted with serving God's, uh, God's people. These, 
overly prioritized works of service, they are taking her away from Christ and they are causing her to live with an empty and simmering anxiety and it is expressed through her frustrations with Mary. Now, Martha is a believer here. She's she's not an unbeliever, but she's distracted. And so Christ instructs her and he rebukes her and he rebukes her for putting serving others ahead of worshiping him. Now, Christ wants us to serve others, right? He says that in John 13, that we're to love each other as he has loved us, that uh, a greater man has no, uh, no one has a greater friend than this. He would lay his life down for his friends. You know what I'm talking about? He wants us to serve each other. But what Christ doesn't want is for us to serve him out of this emptiness, just this shell that hasn't been enriched with connecting with God. And we go about in this just, just empty, dead service to God. And when you serve God like that, you end up a fretting, anxious person who resents others who aren't doing what you're doing. That's what Martha's doing with Mary. She hasn't just sat down and worshipped God. She's busy with service. And sometimes... Really, in every season of life, I would say in busy seasons of life, do do we ever really have one that's not busy? Uh, I don't know about you guys, but I don't. Sometimes the biggest acts of faith that we need is to just take a big or a, a, a big, a good portion of our day, 20 minutes, a significant, relevant portion of our day, and by faith, put the to do list away, put the phone down. And worship Jesus Christ. That is the most faith we need sometimes in some days. I don't know about you guys, but sometimes my to-do list, like you want to talk about the resurrection. I'll be trying to go to the word of God and it's like my my to-do list becomes the big snow monster in Frozen. And it starts throwing snowballs at me. It's like, hey, take care of me. And I'm just like, oh man, I can't be in the word. I got too much to do. And it takes extraordinary faith sometimes to just worship God. But listen, every time I give in to the to-do list snow monster, I always regret it. That whole day is just an anxious, fretting, empty, grumpy, moody day. And every time I tell the snow monster, I'm shut up. And I open the word of God and I lay hold of God till he warms my heart. I've never regretted that one time in my life. And so I don't know about you guys, but I love the story of Mary and Martha because it gives me a text to just sit here and say, Did God preserve this in the scriptures for a reason. I mean, what do you think he wants from us, uh, you know, 2,000 years later reading this story? What do you think he wants us to gain from that? Just be like, oh, that was a cool story. Like, he wants us to imitate Mary. And so what's about to happen to Mary and Martha is that tragedy is going to strike this family. And Mary has the habit of sitting at the feet of Jesus. And he tells her she's chosen the best portion and it's not going to be taken from her. She will have Christ. Her portion of the day was Jesus. And yes, he wants us to serve others, but he wants us to first sit with him and be enriched by him so that when we serve, we're empowered from fresh worship that came that day as we sat at the feet of Jesus. Tragedy is going to hit this family. And I believe as we look at the tragedy, I I can't prove this, but I believe comparing John 11 and Luke 10, I don't think it's a stretch to say, this is my belief, that Martha, between Luke 10 and John 11, Martha learns the priority of worship and that Mary maintains it. And the reason I believe that is because when one of the hardest moments of their life strikes them, the way they respond is beautiful. And the reason they're able to respond to tragedy so well is because they've been prepared for this hardship by the daily adoring of Jesus Christ. So that being said, let's turn now to our main text, Luke chapter 11, uh, verses 1 through 3. Or I said Luke, I meant John. Sorry. John 11, verses 1 through 3. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. 
So the sister said to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. So here we go. We have this serious illness. It overcomes Lazarus. And the sisters here, Mary and Martha, it's the same Mary and Martha from Luke 10. And this text tells us the same Mary who anointed Jesus' feet, with her, wiped him with her tears. Mary's got a thing for the feet of Christ. She sits at his feet and worships in Luke 10. She's the one who wipes his who anoints his feet in worship here. And we're going to see in this story, as soon as Mary comes in, first thing she does, where do you think she's going? His feet. And so this is a family that loves Jesus, that worships Jesus. Illness has struck Lazarus. And Mary and Martha rightly bring this tragedy straight to Jesus. And not only do they do it, but look, uh, bring it to Christ. But look at verse 3. Uh, it says, So the sister said to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. First thing with tragedy that we can take from Mary and Martha. As soon as it hits, go to Jesus. That sounds real simple, but that, it's a lot harder to do sometimes than, uh, than we might think with, the, with that. Sometimes with tragedy hits, we want to run from Jesus. And they run to Jesus. And not only do they run to Jesus, they run saying, He whom you love is ill. They come to Christ in their tragedy and they believe in, they are confident in the love of Christ for their sick brother. And now in verse 4, Jesus is going to say two things about this illness that will drive the entire story. Let's read verse 4. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It's for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. So here's the two statements. The illness of Lazarus, it's not going to end in death. And additionally, this illness, it's for the glory of God. And so that the son of God will be glorified through what's going to happen in connection with the illness of Lazarus. Lazarus. So all that unfolds in this story, it's going to be a demonstration of the glory of God in the Son of God, and it is also going to work towards Lazarus' illness not ending in death. <clears throat> Let's keep going. Verse 5 and 6. Now, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Okay, there's a scene. He loves Martha. He loves Mary. He loves Lazarus. Verse 6. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Why? Wow, that makes a ton of sense. He lo Lazarus is super sick and he loves the whole family. So he doesn't come. He waits for two days. And so now there are three things that are clear, clear from our text. We know that he loves this family. We know that this illness won't end in death. And we know that this illness with Lazarus is for the purpose of bringing glory to God and glory to the Son of God. Those three things are clearly at work. And though those things are stated clearly to be at work in this story and what will drive the whole story, what is remarkable is he says, let's wait for two days. And in the waiting for two days, Jesus has not stopped loving Lazarus. Jesus hasn't stopped loving Mary or Martha, even though he's waiting. Jesus is not working counter to his glory, even though he's waiting. And the illness of Lazarus is still going to not end in death, even though Jesus is waiting. And so one thing I think that's sweet that we can glean from this is that sometimes when there's something in our life that would maybe correspond to the illness of Lazarus and we're coming to Jesus and we're seeking Jesus and we're, 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 we're confident that He loves us and it's still just a big nothing, sometimes it's confusing. Like, well, what are you doing? Why are you waiting? And though the specifics of Lazarus is probably not going to be what happens in our life, we're probably not going to die and be called forth out of a tomb uh, four days later. But I think the principle is something we can learn from. Even when the tragedy's here and it's confusing and it doesn't make sense and God's letting it get worse, his delays are not like our delays. They are perfect timing delays. And he never stops loving us even when the delays are going and even when it's confusing to us. This is a classic example of it right here in Lazarus, uh, the story of Lazarus.
And so, uh, for time's sake, I'm not going to read verses 7 through 16. I'm going to paraphrase them. But in these verses, Jesus informs his disciples that they're going to return to Judea in verse 7. And the disciples, when they respond to this, they're concerned about this because they know it's dangerous for Jesus to be there because the leaders want to kill him. And throughout the dialogue with his disciples that takes place in verses 7 through 16, Jesus in verse 14 eventually informs them that Lazarus has died. And it's confusing. As you're reading the story. Because verse 14 says Lazarus is dead. But if we look back in verse 4. Jesus said this illness will not end in death. But now Lazarus is dead. And so how do we reconcile these? The way that it's going to be reconciled. Is the demonstration of the glory of God. Is going to be to show that through the son of God. He has power even over death. And so throughout this entire episode, uh, Jesus tells his disciples in verse 15, the thing the disciples are going to gain from this is that their faith is going to be strengthened. So moving ahead now to verse 17, verses 17 through 19 set the stage for Christ's arrival at the grave of Lazarus. Let's read them. Now, when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So here we learn in these verses, by the time Jesus gets there, Lazarus has been dead for four days. And as Lazarus is dead and in the tomb, there are many people consoling Mary and Martha in their grief. And these many people who are there ministering to them and consoling them, they're going to become many witnesses to the display of the glory of God, which we saw in the beginning of John 11 is the whole purpose of this event. Now let's look at uh, verse 20. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Here's Martha, the one who once was too distracted and too busy to worship at the feet of Christ. Now what does she do? Is she tending to all the guests who are there and all the mourners who are there? That's not what she's doing. She immediately goes directly to Jesus in the middle of her deep tragedy. She's not worried about whether or not all the consolers have a cup of water. Not that I'm saying that's bad, but her priority is right now. Here he shows up and she runs directly to Jesus. That is different than what we saw in Luke 10. This is growth. And let's see what happens in verse 21. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. And so here this statement, if you read verse 21 in light of everything else Martha says in this episode is where is well she where she finally lands. If you take this verse 21 in light of all that, I believe this statement, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. I don't think it's a. Uh, a bitter grumbling or a pouty, where were you? They he's dead because you didn't try. I don't think it's that kind of thing. Because you got to look at everything else she says in the context. I believe this statement here, she sees him. She just knows. It's an expression of her faith. And it, it isn't a bitter gl- uh, grumbling. She knows, oh man, here I am in the presence of Jesus. You know what? If he would have been here, he would not have died. And this is some, this is a sweet faith that she has in the face of death. And here, look, not only does she say, if you would have been here, he wouldn't have died. Look what she says at verse 22. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Think about the person you love the most. Think about that person dying. And you had requested Christ. He's in his earthly ministry. And then he shows up and sees, and you see him. And it's four days too late. How would you greet him? Would you be mad? Would you be angry? Would you be confused? Would you be like Martha? I, I, I see in Martha here 
there's this joy of seeing Christ. There's kind of this sadness. Oh, you, well, you weren't here, but then there's, but I know that God will give you whatever you ask. You know, there's, there's like this, this mingling of stuff. There's this faith. There's this excitement to see him. And there's this grief. He's dead. You know, she, she's just talking, but out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And then there's just, I believe, this worship and love and faith in Jesus Christ. So let's look how Jesus responds to her in verse 23. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. I mean, Christ gives her the answer that she probably desperately wants. And in her great loss, in her grief, and in her suffering, here is how she responds to Jesus. Verse 24, Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Her faith is tested. She's mourning. She's hurting. She's lost a dear loved one. And then she comes up to Jesus. If you were here, he wouldn't have died, but I know God will give you whatever you ask for. Jesus says, your brother will rise again. And she doesn't say, oh, that's a Sunday school answer. She doesn't get all mad at him for that, for giving her good, sound theology. He he says it. Your brother will rise again. And the reaction to those words is not, yeah, later on because you were late. It's It's not anything like that. It's, I know. He will rise again at the last day. The resurrection. She responds with faith right in the middle of her suffering. She isn't, here she is, death has touched her. As I said, it will touch all of us in the beginning of the sermon. She didn't have empty slogans. She wasn't sitting there giving all these weird, you know, uh, solutions to the greatness of Lazarus and how he really had no sin in his life, which is the kind of stuff you hear at funerals. You know, stuff like that. She wasn't hoping in anything worldly. She wasn't bitter. She wasn't in rebellion. She just worships and she has faith. She has a theological reaction. He will be raised on the last day. Now, what's remarkable to me is that this event and this conversation between uh, Jesus and And Martha, it took place before the New Testament was written. How does Martha know there's going to be a resurrection on the last day? She doesn't have a New Testament. She doesn't have 1 Corinthians 15. She doesn't have even this story. It hasn't finished yet. How does she know there's going to be a resurrection in the last day? I believe uh, it's very likely she knows from Isaiah 26, 19. And here's what Isaiah 26, 19 says. Your dead shall live. Their bodies shall rise. You who dwell in the dust, awake and sing for joy. For your dew is a dew of light and the earth will give birth to the dead. That's a pretty explicit text on the resurrection from the Old Testament. And so knowing her Savior, I believe knowing the promise of Isaiah 26, 19 and having formed a habit of faith and trust in him that that, that worships him daily, her faith rises above her trials. She has hope even in her grief. And as she responds to Christ in faith here, believing he'll be raised at the last day, Martha is about to learn something even greater. She's about to learn something that helps her understand the glory of Christ in a deeper way. And something uh, that is what we saw in the beginning of the story. Something that will be a demonstration of the love of Christ to this family and a demonstration of the glory of God. Here's what she's about to learn. Verse 25. The first statement. Jesus responds to her confidence that Lazarus will be raised on the last day. He responds by saying... I am the resurrection and the life. Resurrection is a future day. Martha's not wrong in believing that. Isaiah 26, 19 prophesies that as well as many places in the New Testament. It is a future day. However, what is so profound about this statement is that resurrection is not just a day. It is also a person. The the day of resurrection that's coming, it's a reality because Christ, the one who is resurrection, is a reality. Jesus Christ is the living embodiment of resurrection and life. He is the resurrection. He is the life. 
Jesus is the supreme living being. All life is from him. All life is in him. He is life itself. In fact, when you watch and read in the scriptures about the earthly ministry of Christ, everything about him is characterized by life. When he is in the presence of the agents of death, namely demons, whatever, he drives them out, they're driven away, and people are restored to their right mind. When Jesus is present with those who are sick, who have illnesses that could lead to death like Lazarus, what does he do? He heals all of it. When Jesus is in the present, uh, presence of literally dead people, He raises them from the dead. Everywhere that Jesus goes in the New Testament, it is life upon life upon life. It's like watching just dead trees just bloom everywhere He goes. He is life. He is the resurrection and the life. And the reason there can be a day of resurrection, a day where we experience life out of death is because there is first a person who is resurrection, a person who is life. And that person is the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's continue uh, uh, study Christ's response. So he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Next statement in verse 25. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And so here is this promise For all who would believe in Him, yes, the awesomeness of death is going to touch you one day. Though you die, it will touch you. But if you believe in Christ, though you die, yet shall you live. We are going to die. But as we have faith in Jesus Christ, the one who was raised from the dead, the one who is resurrection, the one who is life, our bodies will die. But through faith at the return of Christ, our bodies will again be raised. They will be raised to be like Christ's glorious body, immortal, incorruptible, imperishable. 1 Corinthians 15. It's going to happen. Though if we believe in Christ, though we die, this present body, it's going to die. Yet at the coming of Jesus, we shall live. That is the heritage of God's people. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 and 21. Christ is the first fruits of resurrection. He is raised. And then all of us who are in Christ will be raised. Though we die, yet shall we live. The man, resurrection, will give us the reality of a future bodily resurrection. Just as he's been raised. Now, as we continue to read Jesus' response, we gain even further insight to the immortality of his people. Verse 26. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? So, he says, if you look at verse 25, though he die, yet shall he live. But everyone who lives with me will never die. It's a, a wait a second, you just said I was going to die. Now you're just sitting there saying I'm never going to die. How do we put those things together? This is how I, I, who I think he's talking about. Is our body's going to die. And then we will be resurrected with a new body. And then once we've been resurrected, we will then what? Never die. 1 Corinthians 15, uh, verses 50 through 55, tells us that our bodies are incorruptible, imperishable, immortal. They will live forever, just as Christ's resurrected body is Live, lives forever. Ours will live forever. And so, whoever believes in me, though he die physical body, yet shall he live his bo- a new body he'll gain in the resurrection. And the one who believes in me will never die. That new body will never die. We will live forever. 1 John 3, 2 says that at his coming, we will see him as he is. And we will be just like him. And I believe that's a full conformity to Jesus. We're going to have our resurrection bodies. And those resurrection bodies of 1 John 3, 2 are fit and suited to behold the undiluted glory of Christ in his resurrection body. We're going to be perfectly fit to behold his glory forever and to worship him and praise him. And we just finished what? 
two months ago looking at the new heavens and the new earth or the revelation with all the materials of the city and how they have the ability to sparkle with the glory of God. We're going to have these resurrected bodies. We're going to see Christ in His resurrected body. The whole city is going to sparkle with the glory of God. It is all we will see. It is all we will know. And we will continually forever just grow in joy and in worship of Jesus Christ and we will never stop being made progressively more happy as we live into that. Believers will die. We will be raised. And as we're raised, we will never die again. It will be eternal life of worship in the presence of Jesus Christ. Such a one cannot die. And so Jesus gets done saying these things in verse 26. And he asks Martha, do you believe this? And he asks the same thing of us. Do we believe? believe this do you believe that if you have come to jesus christ by faith for salvation trusting he died on the cross from your sins and he rose from the third day do you believe that one day when you die he's going to raise you from the dead and that when you're raised from the dead you will never die you will live in his presence forever do you believe that and if you do i want you to see the blessings that are are promised uh, in this chapter So he asked Martha, do you believe? And here's Martha's response in verse 27. She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God who is coming into the world. So there you go. That's beautiful. Here it is. The one who once was too busy for Jesus now shows great faith and trust in her darkest hour. And I believe she's... Oh, this faith has been grown and honed and developed through daily worship. I think that she learned from her sister Mary. And she grew in having disciplined time to worship God. And now here she is in her tragedy. And all that's coming out of her is, yes, there's hurt. Yes, there's grief. Yes, there's even confusion. But there is great faith. And so, after professing faith, Mary now goes, or I'm sorry, Mary, I'm saying Mary, I mean Martha, the busy one. So if I'm mixing that up, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. This has all been Martha the whole time. Um, So after professing faith, Martha goes to get her sister, verse 28 through 31. When she said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here and he's calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. And when the Jews who were with her uh, in the house consoling her saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. So, uh, here we go. Mary is now arriving and once she faces Jesus, the one who made a habit of sitting at his feet, she responds with the kind of fruit forged from consistent daily worship. Let's look at what she does in verse 32. Now, when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. So here she is again. The place she loves to be, the feet of Jesus. She sits there when he's in her home teaching. She anoints his feet with, uh, in worship in another, in another context. And here, the, the, the feet of Jesus, it's not just the place where she learns. It's not just the place where she anoints him in worship. It is also the place where she casts her grief. And her statement to Jesus here, I again, I also don't, I don't believe here with her either that this is complaining to him. I I, I it's just you know I, it, she she loves him. She knows she's in the presence of his greatness, and she sits here and just worships him again with a confused heart. I don't get it. If you'd have been here, he wouldn't have died. She's just, she's just raw with him at the feet of Jesus. And here's how Jesus responds in verses 33 through 35. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. 
<clears throat> I love this text because knowing what he's about to do, he still allows himself to be moved in his spirit over her pain. Let's keep reading. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. In verse 35, Jesus wept. So Jesus, he knows exactly what he's about to do. He knows that he's fixing to raise Lazarus from the dead. Nevertheless, he pauses and he stops to care about this family's pain. So much so that the text says his spirit is troubled and he cries with them. I'm kind of convicted by this because I wouldn't have done this. I'm like, oh, it's all right. Come on. Come on. Yeah, let me show you what I'm going to do. Uh, that's not what I would have done. But Jesus, he just takes his time and he just enters into the pain of the people whom he loves. And he takes time to be troubled with spirit in his spirit with them. He takes time to weep with them, even though he knows what he's going to do. And so I think there's a good lesson on compassion and empathy that we can take from this text is look at how Jesus handles this situation. He's not afraid to speak theological truth, right? He's not intimidated by death. He's like, he's going to rise again. I'm the resurrection. I'm the life. You believe in me, though you die, yet shall you live. And whoever believes in me will never die. He's not intimidated by the situation so that he's silenced into not talking about from the word of God. Sometimes that can happen to us. Someone's suffering and we get so spooked by the situation, we're afraid to speak the word. But at the same time, Jesus is not just, oh, well, resurrection comes someday. Hey, cheer up, lady. Uh, he's not acting like that. He can weep with her. He can enter into the pain and with the seasoned spirit that hurts with her, he still speaks the truth of God's word, but with a tenderness that is suited to the situation. I think it is wrong. Uh, it, it's wrong for us to feel like we can't speak the truth into intimidating situations. But it would also be wrong for us to just flippantly walk in there and uh, kind of just blurt out some things in a cold hearted, cavalier kind of manner. And we can learn from Jesus here about ministering to really intense sufferings and tragic situations. Enter into the pain. Enter into the uh, suffering of the person. And at the same time, do not let the situation scare you and think that it's bigger than the word of God because it's not. Now, the onlookers, when they see this happen, they are so moved by this that they have the following response in verse 36 to 37. So the Jews said, oh, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? So here we have two different reactions to Christ here. Is one group marvels at his love. And the other group seems angry that he didn't save him and doubts his love. And the reason I think it's anger is because of how John, he puts the two groups against each other here. One group marvels, oh, see how he loved. But the other one said, well, pff, why did you? You open the eyes of a blind man, why couldn't you do this? And so because those two groups are juxtaposed to each other, I think we see one group trusts him. One group knows that he operates out of love and the other is suspicious of him. And they doubt his love because things didn't go the way they thought they should. And so now as the, this stage is set, the time has come for the purpose of this whole episode. What was it? You remember the beginning of the chapter. It is that this illness will not end in death. The glory of God will be demonstrated and the love of Christ for this family will be on display as well. Now it's time for all three of those things to unfold together. Verse 38. Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. And Jesus said, Take away the stone. And so uh, uh, Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there'll be, a, uh, there'll be an odor, for he's been dead for four days. And so here's Jesus, take away the stone. And he's not giving this command in vain. He knows he's the resurrection and the life and he will raise him. And Martha here, again, she's confused. She doesn't want her brother dishonored by having everyone smell the stench of his decaying body. 
Again, this isn't rebellion. It's just confusion and honest dialogue with Christ. And so Jesus ministers to her response in verse 40, and he does so by way of reminder. Look at verse 40. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? Here it is. This episode, it's going to be dripping with God's glory. That is what he promised in the beginning. And so the obvious implication here is that they need to listen to him and they need to remove the stone because the glory of God is on its way. Let's look at verse 41 through 42. So they took away the stone and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. So here, Jesus in this prayer, right before he demonstrates the glory of God, he gives thanks to God for hearing his prayer, not because Jesus himself is doubting. He's not like, oh, I'm glad you listened to my prayer. I didn't know, Lord. That's not what was going on. He wasn't doubting. Instead, he thanks God for hearing his prayer because he knows that what's going to transpire, it's going to result in the building of faith for those who will witness his glory. If you look back in verse 15, what did he tell his disciples was going to happen to them? Their faith is going to grow through what goes on with Lazarus. That's what he says in verse 15. Now here's this prayer, thanking God, because here is coming. Their faith is about to grow. And now at verses 43 through 44, we have some of the greatest words written in the scripture. Let's read them. And when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Here it is. Resurrection, the person. Life, the person. Gives life to the dead by the power of His Word. The the one whose very essence is life, Jesus Christ. He makes the dead live, and in so doing, He fulfills many promises. Just as Jesus said in the beginning of John 11, this illness does not end in death, and it didn't. Just as he said in the beginning of this episode that this is going to happen so that the glory of God would be displayed through the glorification of the Son of God, that has just happened. Jesus, the resurrection, the life has come and demonstrated He is the one who has power over death and He exercises His power to bring life out of death through His Word. Come out! And He does. The glory of God is radiating at the tomb of Lazarus, which is exactly what Jesus said the point of this entire episode was. He has the unique power. I said in the beginning of the message, when you stare down the awesomeness of death, you don't need a secular Hallmark card. You don't need someone telling you in your morning, you're a really strong person. You'll get through this because you're so strong. I ain't going to help you. I don't feel strong. I'm falling to pieces. Now you just put pressure on me to be something I know I can't be. Thanks. You don't need that. You need facing down death, something greater than death. And there's one thing. It's Jesus, the resurrection and the life. And he just displayed his power that he is greater than death. And he is the only one that is greater than death. And so as these things unfolded, the illness of Lazarus not ending in death and the glorification of God through the Son of God who has the power to bring life out of death, as those two things unfolded, the third promise thing unfolds. Namely, that Lazarus, Mary, and Martha realize the love of Christ now in a way they never would have realized if he would have just showed up and healed them. I mean, let's think about it. We just prayed just now for Augustine's strep throat to be healed. What would help us realize the glory of the Son of God and the love of Christ more? If he healed her strep throat, we say, thank you, Lord. Or if she, like, dies, and we're like, whoa, and we're at her funeral, and then she pops out of the grave. 
Obviously, we see here a greater demonstration of the love of Christ and the glory of Christ. But if you would have asked Mary and Martha and Lazarus when they first brought the news to Jesus, what would show the glory of Jesus and his love for you? Heal it! So sometimes what we think would give us the greatest knowledge of God's love for us, what we think would help us know the glory of God uh, most, it's not what God thinks. And so when the answer is no, we get a test. Am I going to fall at his feet and worship like Mary? Am I going to still go to him like Martha? Uh, Tell him about my confusion, but also tell him about my faith. Am I going to do that and wait on God and see what he does? Or am I going to become angry with God and justified in my rebellion and throw a fit and run away from him? There's so much value in just trusting God. It's a very simple thing and it's very hard to do. But there's so much value. When you bag stuff in, uh, you, you just turn from God. Man, you, you miss out on things that God would, God would have for you to show you His glory. And listen, if your heart is in love with God, if the Lord told you, I'm not going to answer it this way, but I promise you, you'll know my glory better. Is that a bad thing? That's a wonderful thing if your heart's been made alive to Jesus Christ. Because enjoying the glory of God is, oh man, that is the oxygen to your lungs and the blood that flows through your spiritual veins is loving the glory of God. And so here, as all these things unfold, this family gets to know the glory of Christ in a powerful way. And this wasn't an unconverted family. I mean, Jesus regularly hung out with these guys. They were like, close. Yeah, uh, he taught them. They they, they knew him, but it just took it to a whole new level and the whole new level of the love of God and the glory of God and their understanding, it came in tragedy. They didn't learn this playing golf together. It came through tragedy in meeting God and his love and his glory in the hardest moments and in confusion, but staying the course on Christ and not chucking the faith following Him no matter what, and just bringing our grief and tears and confusion and just throwing them there at His feet and watching Him move. Because He still does this. I don't know if we're we're probably not going to see somebody pop out of their grave at a funeral. I think that awaits the day of resurrection, but I'll let God decide that. But He still does these same types of things. Or a situation that looks like sure death, and even is death, God brings life. But we have to... I almost have one there. (laughs) Trip over there, break my neck, and resurrect me. That would be cool. Uh, But it is our duty to trust Him. And to love Him. And to not lose confidence that He loves us. Isn't it? You know one thing that really bothers me about me? Is how quickly God shows me I can become suspicious of God's love for me. I hate that about myself. And how many, you know, think about some of the nonsense that flies around today. Well, if you have enough faith, God will heal you. What if you say that to Mary? You know, and to Martha, Lazarus dead because you didn't believe enough. You didn't do this. You didn't do that. You didn't do this. Is that why Jesus said Lazarus died? No, he said this death is for the glory of God and the glory of the Son of God. They didn't do anything wrong. He just died. And so it is possible in those moments, man, did God do Did I do something? God's just mad at me and all this sort of stuff. No, 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 no. This text tells us he loved them. I mean, it says it repeatedly in this whole episode, how much Jesus loved this family. And he loves us. He loves us in our tragedies. He loves us in good times. He loves us in average times. He loves us in tragedies. He doesn't ever stop loving us. And He is constantly at work in our lives to help us to know more of His glory and to help us to know more of His love. And sometimes that means good food. Sometimes that means comfort. Sometimes it means a beautiful mountain hike 
and, and, and a nice date with your spouse or a fun time with your kids. And sometimes it means illnesses that don't go away, injuries that never heal, the death of loved ones, things stripped away from you that you didn't want to lose. In all of those things, He doesn't change. He loves you and He's working for you to know His glory. His glory is in everything. So I think that is one of the greatest things about celebrating the resurrection is what looks like the darkest night ever. The crucifixion of Jesus actually is the night of the greatest hope. And so just as Lazarus dies and is raised from the dead, this episode's a pointer to about a week later, a greater death and a greater resurrection. Jesus Christ goes to the cross himself. And just as the people were mocking him at the tomb of Lazarus, oh, I couldn't the one who healed the blind man kept him from dying? What do they say to him on the cross? Yeah, he healed others. Why can't he save himself? You know, the same mocking demonic spirit going on at the, at the crucifixion of Christ. But at the crucifixion of Christ, it's greater than the death of Lazarus. The death of Lazarus points to the glory of God, but, it, but just by showing Christ can raise from the dead, but it didn't atone for sins. There's a greater death, greater than the death of Lazarus, is the death of Christ. And at the death of Christ, when He was on the cross, God punished Him for all of our sins. And so if we believe in Him, the death of Christ wipes all our sins away. And then three days later, Christ is, rises from the grave and His resurrection is greater than the resurrection of Lazarus. Lazarus rises again, but he dies again. Jesus was raised from the dead and He's got a brand new body. And it is incorruptible, immortal. He will never die again. In fact, his body can ascend up into heaven. I like telling the kids we're going to fly someday because uh, we get one of his bodies and he's able to ascend up into heaven. There's my text, Superman. There, there it is. <laughs> he can ascend. And we were fight. He goes in through doors, in and out of it, all this stuff, but yet he remains, he's got scars still on his hands. And he can keep himself from being recognized and he can reveal himself. He's got this incredible, glorious body that will never die again. It's a greater resurrection. And one day we're going to be raised not like Lazarus, where we die again, but like Christ, where we're indestructible, immortal, or immortal. <laughs> immortal. To see him forever and enjoy him forever. And so, um, here's how two people responded as Lazarus was resurrected. Verse 45 Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. And as you keep reading, they're telling the Pharisees for the purpose of ratting Jesus out so the Pharisees can kill him. So you can respond to this in two ways. You can believe in worship or you can kill him, not in the sense that you can actually kill him, but you can murder him out of your life. Get out of here. I don't want that. I don't want him. I want a God that's going to make me comfortable all my days. I want a God that's going to give me everything my carnal heart craves. I want a God that will let me gain the world and then keep my soul. I want that kind of God. You're not going to have that. That, that, that kind of God doesn't exist. It's called a demon. But if you want a God who, no matter what he does in your life, is going to show you the glory of Jesus Christ and love you by helping you know that glory more, man, come to Jesus Christ. Cast your sins on him. He loves you. He is with you. And the power of resurrection is constantly at work. Listen, as, as, as believers, if God can raise him from the dead, couldn't he work things in your heart that you'd like to see grow this year that aren't there? Can He make you a more humble person or a more caring person or thoughtful or courageous or whatever? If He can raise the dead, can He not do that? Can He not, if He could put His own son to death, could He not put to death things in your life that you don't like to, that you don't like that are there? Of course He can. We have a God of resurrection. He calls into existence things that do not exist as though they once did. He has got great power. Nothing is impossible with God for the sake of His glory and His kingdom. And so let yourself be refreshed and awakened with hope and joy because of the greatness and power of the one who is resurrection, the one who is life, Jesus Christ. So, let's pray. 
Father, uh, we thank you for your plan of salvation. We thank you that before the ages began, you knew sin would enter the world. You knew how you would overcome it. The son agreed to die on the cross before anything even existed. You knew you would raise him. You did so by the spirit. The spirit then is given when he ascends into heaven to come and testify to the glory of Christ. God, we just praise you as our triune God for how you've worked in salvation. We love it, God. We love We love the birth, the virgin birth of Jesus. We love the sinless life of Jesus. We love the uh, incarnation. He's fully God and fully man. We love the miracles of Jesus. We love the teaching of Jesus. We love the healings of Jesus and the casting out of demons and raising the dead like he did with Lazarus. We love the crucifixion of Jesus where he took away our sins. We love the resurrection of Jesus where he triumphed over the grave. We love the ascension of Jesus where he went right into your presence and offered himself for one time. He went through the greater tabernacle, heaven, offering himself once. The, the, he obtains eternal redemption by the sacrifice of himself and sits at your right hand and intercedes for us and waits for his enemies to become his footstool. And he shepherds the church and he walks among the church through the word of God and he sends the spirit to testify of Christ and to dwell in our heart and to seal us and to guarantee our inheritance and to pr- uh, create the fruit of the spirit within us and sanctify us and reveal the glory of Christ to our hearts so that we're in love with it. God, we just thank you for all these things and we thank you, Jesus, you're going to come back and that heaven and earth will disappear. There'll be a new heaven and a new earth and a resurrection and we'll worship forever and you'll crush your enemies. We just praise you for all of it. And Lord, we pray that you would help us, God, in the difficult things we go through in the comfortable things we go through and the enjoyable things we go through and the boring things that we go through. Help us learn to sit at your feet on a regular basis and to worship you and learn from you day by day by day by day by day. We love you. God, please help us not drift from that. Help us to learn from Mary and Martha and to be uh, consistent worshipers uh, for, for many reasons so that we can just love you and so we can grow and enjoy your glory, but also... So that when our turn comes, when the tragedy hits, we can respond with the same faith uh, as your servants. Lord, we love you. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for rising rising from the dead. Thank you for saving us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.